Breadbox Media Programming is brought to you by... I actually met my wife on CatholicSingles.com, if you can believe that. Really? And about Yes, I had never done that before. Didn't have any problems with dating. Natalie and Aaron met on CatholicSingles.com after they realized that they needed to find someone who shared their faith. Meet other faithful Catholics on the original Catholic dating site. Download our app today for free. Looking for a way to build daily prayer discipline? Seen the rise in mindfulness meditation, but not sure if it is possible to meditate in a way that's consistent with your Catholic faith? Just looking for a way to breathe new life into your existing prayer routine? No matter what you're looking for, Hollow is here to help. Hollow is a Catholic prayer and meditation app that helps users deepen their relationship with God through audio-guided contemplative prayer sessions. From meditations on the daily gospel to the rosary to daily examines, Hollow has something for everyone. Hollow is the number one Catholic app in the U.S. It is free to download and has permanently free content, but you can also check out all of the premium sessions for 30 days, risk-free, by signing up at www.hollow.com. Dot app slash breadbox. Well, hey everyone, and welcome to this week's episode where we have a terrific opportunity to sit down with the co directors, writers, and producers of the amazing new documentary. Flannery. Joining us today on the on the show are Elizabeth Kaufman and Mark Bosco. Um, and welcome to the show. We're really pleased to be with both of you. So glad to be Thank here. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Elizabeth. Let me jump off with you initially and just ask you. Um, this is a, a really comprehensive look at um, an author and a, a, a figure that many of us know. Um, from the faith perspective as a, a Catholic writer and also a very strong woman and a literary genius. Um, how, how did the film come about and what inspired you to, to create this documentary? Well, I should let Mark tell part of the story because he, he really initiated it and brought me in with some earlier interviews that he had. I'll let you, I'll let Mark tell you about that uh, as a filmmaker and an English major, and I'm from the South, I, when Mark asked me to help him make a film, I immediately uh, said yes. That was a wise choice. And yeah. Mark, you're, you were um, in the midst of this. Um, we we want to say up front that you're, one of your roles is um, in leadership at, at Georgetown University and that you are a member of the Society of Jesus, a Jesuit priest. Where did you get the idea for this? Yes, you know, I, my as a as an English professor as well at a university, I was working on on, on my own take on Flannery. I was always drawn to her, obviously as a Catholic writer, but also just the way that the aesthetics of violence and, that, and the way she was uh, this unique modernist in many ways in American uh, writers. Um, and so I, it really happened because a good friend of mine, um, who I was visiting, said, "Listen, about ten years earlier in the 1990s, uh, I I took I was thinking about." Uh, for posterity's sake, trying to interview people who knew Flannery O'Connor. And so he, he uh, interviewed the great, uh, you know, Sally Fitzgerald, who collects all of Flannery O'Connor's letters and puts them into the habit of being, which wins all these awards. She, she helps to organize her essays. Uh, he, so Christopher, our friend, goes around and he does this and basically sits on these interviews for about a decade. Uh, he gives them to me and says, you know, you should do something with them. And I was like, well, let me look at them. Um, and I was like, oh, my gosh, this is, the, this is amazing. This is the, the core, the, the backbone of, uh, of a documentary on Flannery. So that's when I immediately um, uh, talked to um, Elizabeth. I always like to call myself the, the, the Flannery O'Connor geek who, who didn't know how to really do documentary film, was really in, you know, brought into how to do it through, uh, through the talent of uh, Elizabeth and her and her collaborators. So it's been a really interesting uh, collaboration. What an amazing thing. Elizabeth, I have to ask you about the voice of Mary Steenburgen as, um, as Flannery's voice, how, um, how that came about and uh, why she so thoroughly nails Flannery. 
Well, Mary Steenburgen was really our, our top pick in terms of um, her distinctive Southern voice. And as an actress, she had, uh, I, I'm from Jacksonville, Florida. I remember a film she had done where she was Marjorie Keenan Rawlings. And I wrote her a heart and her agent a heartfelt letter about how perfect I thought she would be as O'Connor's voice. And, and she said yes. So her, uh, we were just delighted uh, that our our top pick was really uh, interested and engaged with the story, and uh, we had a pretty good cut at that point, um, and just needed uh, someone to provide both the personal voice of Flannery O'Connor and then a voice in the um, the short stories too. Yeah, she's really, um, she does such a beautiful job. Um, Mark, I want to ask you about the other voices that we hear from both um, in, intimates or um, family members and close colleagues of, of O'Connor and also modern day kind of celebrity um, artists in their own right. How did you kind of assemble this cast of people to speak to her um, experience? Yeah, you know, ha- having uh, known a bit of her biography and having, you know, tried to, uh, to, to investigate even my in my own work, some of the people, uh, certainly Eric Lonker, the Danishman, uh, I had been working on that already. Um, but one of the things we, we discovered is that the more and more we started working on this film, on her biography uh, and some of her stories, the more and more we kept on seeing artists, uh, contemporary artists, mention Flannery O'Connor in interviews or on film or in, or in podcasts. And so we really just kind of went around and, and wrote their agents or wrote them directly and said, listen, Alice Walker, we know you've written on Flannery O'Connor. Would you sit and talk about why Flannery O'Connor is important uh, to you now uh, as an African-American uh, writer, uh, maybe to the All-American all Arts and Letters? We did the same thing with uh, Tobias Wolf at Stanford. We did the same thing with Alice McDermott. At Hilton Ells at The New Yorker sat down, and he said, of course, I would love to talk to, about Flannery O'Connor. So what we, what we, the film, I think, tries to do is not only tell her story, but have these very articulate artists Say why Flannery O'Connor is important to the status of art in the United States and to the craft of art and to their own sense of uh, kind of uh, nurturing them along by their reading. One of the, one of the people we didn't get in our film, uh, which was too bad, was uh, Bruce Springsteen, who said that you know he wrote um, he wrote his album Nebraska after re-reading Flannery O'Connor's short stories. That somehow it was a response to that, and um, because he was on Broadway, he wouldn't uh, sit down with us. But uh, we do have some of his music at the end of the film, as you know. <laughs> oh, I was going to I'm going to ask about music in just a little bit. Elizabeth, I want to ask you and we'll, okay. we'll discuss in a few minutes kind of the unusual nature of the launch of this particular documentary. But I want to ask you about its its arrival at this point in time when societally we are dealing with a conversation about race and racial issues. And uh, it seems almost as though this comes at a moment where perhaps we would converse about it differently now than we might have six months or a year ago, but you don't shy away from it and uh, from the, the racial, you know, at, at times I'll just say there are epithets used in this um, that we wouldn't use and we won't use in the interview, but why, um, why is this an important conversation to have right now? And, and uh, what do you have to say about that? Well, absolutely. It's, it's, it's a big conversation to have right now. Right. In many ways. Um, and um, Ken Burns on CNN recently said that what's happening, he described what's happening as the great reckoning for for America in terms of in terms of race. And it's it feels very much like what was happening at the time Flannery died in the 1960s and her how she how she handles race, how she deconstructs white racism and, and white racist characters uh, it's better than almost any Southern writer that I can think of. Uh, we were talking about Alice Walker earlier, and she's in the film. She grew up 20 minutes away from O'Connor, and she has written very eloquently and uh, about going with her mother to Flannery O'Connor's house and, and what that experience was like when Alice Walker had grown up in a much smaller house, uh, sharecroppers type of house um, in Inton. And Alice Walker wound up saying later, she said, you know, Flannery O'Connor gave her inspiration and hope that she could be a writer, a nationally known writer from Georgia. And then Alice Walker said, 
and I'm going to tell the other side of the story. So I, I think it's it's important to to read Flannery O'Connor. It's important to read Alice Walker, right? So O'Connor is was never trying to, uh, and Alice Walker said this directly that she, that O'Connor never tried to enter the subjectivity of of her black characters, but she she portrayed the judgment that was being thrown out them by the white racist idiotic characters and that's what O'Connor was so good at was showing both the horror and the humor behind uh, a certain kind of white privilege and condescension. Yeah, I'm kind of curious, Mark. That's a beautiful, beautifully said, Elizabeth. Mark, I'm I'm just a little curious about having, you know, I would imagine when you spend time um, creating a documentary that you even more thoroughly than you would as an academician um, in engross yourself in the voice of someone almost to the sense that they might like live inside you a little bit or live inside your brain. How do you think that Flannery yep. O'Connor might have responded to this time that we find ourselves living in? Yeah, you know, I think, um, you know, she dies in 1964, right, as, you know, things are beginning to change, civil rights legislation is just happening. Um, I think that she, um, I think that she, I think O'Connor knew that she herself was a recovering racist, that, that she grew up in, a, in an era that she knew had to change, but she had the same complacent kind of white privilege that uh, so many people continue to even have. So I think that in many ways, O'Connor... Um, O'Connor would would be sensitive, I think, in a way that, that I think uh, we would I, I think would, would resonate with today's world. Um, I think that we, we, we catch her before she dies in 1964, really grappling with this question of race, especially in her last great uh, piece, that short story revelation, where we end the film with. Um, she's really trying to kind of I think um, artistically craft. Uh, her own kind of um, way of responding to it. And as an artist, she would say that what most accounts is what, what the artist art says, not what I can say. The art says it for me. That said, I, I really do believe she's a recover. She would, she would use that title. She's a recovering, she's recovering from the constant white privilege that she um, grew up in and breathed and sees in many ways to use a very Catholic term or the Christian term sinful. Uh, and that she knows that she shouldn't be this way. And therefore, she needs to try to come to, to, to grips with that. I don't know if she would have continued to write about it, um, but there is a sense that in her last stories, she's grappling with race in a way that's almost prescient, almost. I mean, when we were doing this film, still doing in the midst of it, you know, Black Lives Matter had already started in 2015 and all this stuff. And we really had a sense that, um, wow, O'Connor seems even more important today than she might have been 25 years ago in terms of, of race, that she, she shows and exposes um, the kind of uh, almost unconscious racism that was just part of white, that's part of white culture, or part of American culture. Yeah, I certainly fodder for conversation. And Elizabeth, I want to ask you about, you know, the kind of um, launch structure, given the unusual period of time that we find ourselves in as as artists and <laughs> for you as filmmakers where you can't traditionally do, you know, the typical premiere that you would do. Um, you know, you're doing a virtual launch and um, you're proposing virtual conversations and virtual screenings. Can you say a little bit more about that and how that kind of fits into seeing a film like this and then having a conversation about it? Absolutely. Yes, we are uh, delighted that uh, we're having this July 17th virtual premiere at how many uh, theaters around the country have, have, have picked the film up because we think the story is so valid to tell right now. And uh, Lisa Trefoni, our great publicist, is also on the line. And, and we are having uh, some recorded conversations online uh, following the July 17th premiere uh, with me and Mark uh, about uh, topics of faith and race uh, and craft and disability. Some of the, the four really important themes that we think are, are, are in the documentary as well in terms of how they impacted her life. Perfect. And we're going to definitely have more uh, information on that conversation and links to those 
um, opportunities in our show notes for the podcast. Mark, um, you know, um, Hillary, or I'm sorry, Flannery is, is uh, in a sense, her work is defined um, by not only her lupus, but also by her Catholicism. And um, you, you really, in, yeah. in the film, do a beautiful job of kind of um, discussing that and taking it on. How did she grapple in a way in her writings with her, her own lived faith? Yeah, you know, um, it's, it's, it's almost remarkable to think that, you know, Flannery O'Connor uh, read for her nightly fun reading Thomas Aquinas in the Summa Theologica. <laughs> um, but she had a much, she had a deep Catholic um, intellectual curiosity, that her, her, her intellectual curiosity uh, met the faith tradition. And so uh, she's reading, um, she's reading all the great uh, Catholic writers of England and France, uh, Moria and Berlanos. Uh, Graham Greene and Waugh. Um, she's she's in, she's reading the philosopher. She knows Thomas Aquinas. She's reading Saint Catherine of Genoa. She's reading um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Baron. Um, she's reading a lot. All these excellent kind of people who are almost in that moment of modernism, where they're saying, "Can one be Catholic? Is being Catholic a modernist pose? Uh, can one be Catholic in this modern age?" And, and I, in many ways. Her life and her work, I think, expressed this uh, so brilliantly. She was trying to find an aesthetic to talk about redemption uh, and, a, and struggle uh, in, in redemption. In, in our film, we have Mary Gordon in a wonderful line where she, she was she was fearless in, in the face of darkness. She would she, she looked into the face of darkness. She tried to write about it, and even there, she could find grace. Uh, even there, and so you're shaken by a lot of kind of works. But in many ways, she's found the kind of the spiritual uh, moment of awakening or insight, um, or as we might say theologically, grace. Grace, definitely. You know, Elizabeth, I wanted to ask you about um, some components of any wonderful documentary or um, elements such as um, the the, doc the documentary footage that you find in archival photos. But one major um, kind of gift in this film is the animation and also the score, the music behind it. Can you say a few words about those pieces? Certainly. Uh, I'll start with the music. We worked with the great uh, composer, Miriam Cutler, who's done just wonderful work, um, award-winning work for, uh, for documentaries, RBG, um, and any number of pieces. And, and then I, I found a lot of archival music, uh, music that was either in, um, we knew O'Connor listened to, uh, like The Singing Nun, uh, which we found in her in her room, uh, and then uh, music of the era, like Brenda Lee. So I'm, I, I'm on the board of an archive. I love both arch archival filmmaking as well as archival uh, music of the period. And Miriam Cutler did this beautiful score that went around um, archival music that includes, uh, that goes to listen to Williams and Bruce Springsteen. So it's not all uh, 1960s, 1950s music either. Uh, in terms of the the visuals, Flannery O'Connor started as a cartoonist, and I immediately respond to, it, to her writing because it's so visual as well as auditory. She hears the voices of the people around her. Uh, she paints pictures of them. And, and so ha hiring animators, we hired three great female animators uh, who illustrated both O'Connor's life uh, as well as... Uh, her fiction. So we spend a lot of time on those elements, in part because there's only one television interview of Flannery O'Connor, and there aren't many photographs. <laughs> so we had to be creative in thinking of other uh, images. Well, it's it's so beautifully put together. I was actually so thrilled during the screener to be able to uh, to kind of sit and um, pause and journal some reactions that I had to it. And I know that I this is one that I will watch time and again. Can you tell us, Elizabeth, how um, folks can get a hold of watching this on the 17th when it la launches? Well, if you go to FlannerySilm.com, uh, you can click on the screening schedule and see what theaters around the country are going to offer them virtually. And if you are, I think, close enough, within 100 miles or closer, you'll be able to watch virtually online. Uh, we do, we are hoping for um, 
for more theaters and to be all over the country and then uh, for looking for a television broadcast too. Fantastic. I can't wait to watch it in that um, in that way. Um, Mark, on any closing thoughts before we uh, let you get on to your next conversation about the film? I would just say that I think that um, uh, doing the documentary on, on this on Plenary just shows not only how um, brilliant she is, but we really get a slice of life of what it was, what it was like in America between 1940 uh, until her death in 1964, and then even beyond. Um, I, I, I really do think that by looking at Samuel O'Connor's life and her work, we, 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 get a, we get an entrance into what was the racial tensions. We get, we get a sense of how Catholicism was at play in the world uh, of, of America. We get a sense of, of what lupus and disability really meant uh, during the time when there was very little treatment. Uh, and we also get this very uh, this talented uh, woman from the South who's uh, really got the, the great artists of, of New York, the great critics of New York behind her. They, there's a recognized talent for great art. So I think I, you have a sense of, of everything going on in the 20th century that I think, at least the last half, kind of uh, synopsized or at least kind of touched upon in her life. And I'm, I'm hoping that the film uh, has done that, has, has, has broadened out Flannery not only to show not only how great her work is and how important it is, but it gives us a sense of walking back into our own history. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, friends. This, I, uh, just, oh, yeah, Elizabeth, jump in. I was, was going to add real quick that I'm not Catholic. I was raised Protestant and, and really was approaching the film uh, from a secular point of view, but also having a sister who's a pre- Presbyterian minister. So, yeah, Mark and I have a great uh, collaborative uh, relationship and found that tension between Protestants and Catholics very much a part of the story uh, O'Connor's telling, too, in, in the South with, with a sense of humor and loving, uh, loving uh, parody. <laughs> yeah, it, it's uh, it's just a fascinating look at a slice of life that many of us don't know in today's age that we we look back at history to learn from those stories. So it's a it's very well told. And uh, I want to congratulate you and, and just wish you all the best for a, a successful um, retelling of this story that needs to be out there. Uh, thanks so much, Lisa, for being a supporter. Well, that's it, folks. We will have links in the show notes for you to get a hold of all the information you need about Flannery launching July 17th. God bless. These are unprecedented times for our world our nation, and our faith. Cities are being burned. The debate rages over our national identity, and a global pandemic has shut down our parishes and deprived the faithful of the sacraments. Times like these can challenge our faith and our hope. Now more than ever, Catholics need to utilize technological advances to strengthen their faith. Endorsed by faithful bishops and cardinals, Breadbox Media is answering this need by providing on-demand podcasting that is faithful to the magisterial teachings of the Catholic Church. Our podcasts let you nurture your faith at any location, at your convenience, and at no cost. We are able to provide this free service because of the generosity of our donors. Would you consider giving a donation today to support this vital ministry? Not only is your donation tax deductible, but you will be helping to transform hearts, minds, and our culture for Christ. Donations can be made by going to breadboxmedia.com. Thank you, and may God bless you.